All right, so this Tuesday, buckle up because we are supposed to find out who Kamala Harris's running mate is going to be. Now, she's holding this rally with her running mate in Philadelphia. Hmm, is that a bit of a hint into who she's choosing? Is it possible that she's choosing Josh Shapiro? I don't know, but it kind of seems likely. Um, I really hope that she doesn't because this is somebody that is not going to excite many people. If anything, I think that if she chose Josh Shapiro, that risks hurting some of the momentum that she has. I don't think it would kill the momentum, but I think that if she wants to take things to the next level, the obvious choice is Tim Waltz. He's somebody who has crossover appeal between liberals and leftists. He's accomplished a lot of very progressive things as the governor of Minnesota, but he's also, you know, he's a liberal. He's a Democrat, tried and true. So I think that if she picks Josh Shapiro, that's going to be a mistake. And I'll be very disappointed, uh, not necessarily because I care deeply about who the VP is going to be. I think at the end of the day, she's probably going to make more of a strategic choice. And I think Josh Shapiro makes sense in that regard because she wants to win Pennsylvania. That being said, I think that galvanizing the base should be priority number one. And I don't want Shapiro because I don't want this to be the guy that we have to fight in four to eight years, right? This is somebody who is pro-charter school. This is somebody who is anti-BDS. He said that protesters, uh, the pro-Palestinian protesters were like the KKK. On top of that, he has scandals that make him an actual liability here. Now, to address something real quick, there's been some liberals who have suggested that lefties don't like Josh Shapiro because he's Jewish. That is absolute nonsense. Many lefties are perfectly fine with J.B. Pritzker, who is also Jewish. On top of that, like you can't yell at Bernie bros and claim that they're anti-Semitic when this movement like was catalyzed by Bernie Sanders, a Jewish man. So I feel like it kind of reminds me of this cynical, you know, attack against people who are saying Biden should drop out. Remember the liberals who were like, oh, my God, isn't it coincidental that it's all white guys saying Biden should drop out? And it's like, well, why is why is that even a factor? Biden is a white dude. It's just really weird. So they're kind of trying to do that again when I feel like maybe you should listen a little bit more to the people who said Biden should drop out since it turned out they were very right. But I mean, I want to share this clip here. So this is something that is going to come up. You're running against a rapist and you don't want a liability on the ticket anywhere in that sphere. But if you choose Shapiro, then you are getting into this. So this is a clip that uh, this person shared here of CNN talking about Josh Shapiro. You know, there's a little known story about Governor Shapiro that's starting to gain some traction and it happened last year when his top aide was accused of sexual harassment of a subordinate and uh, there were criticisms about the governor's response to this and the fact that it took so long for him to actually say much about it or in fact for this for this aide to resign. Meantime, the woman of course was, was pushed out. And I think in 2024, I would know something about this after suing Fox News and Roger Ailes for harassment back in 2016. You know, this doesn't cut it in 2024 anymore. You can't put these stories under the carpet and expect to not have people talk about them. So Governor Shapiro, in my mind, should let that woman out of her non-disclosure agreement tonight, tomorrow, and possibly put out a press statement about how he maybe should have handled it slightly different. He's never actually said anything about the aid as far as any kind of criticism. And when you're running with a female candidate at the top of the ticket, and you are looking for the female votes, this story could become a much bigger problem speaking of that. And he wasn't implicated, but the $295,000 settlement that they made with this woman. That is a good point about just what the landscape looks like compared to, you know, obviously in the Bill Clinton days to what it looks like now, what they're considering. Well, we've come a long way um, with these issues. And, and the other problem I have is that the governor said, oh, it's a great thing that we push this into secrecy. No. The way we solve these problems is that we talk about them and we don't push them into secrecy through, through NDAs. So again, I would call on him to release this woman from the NDA. But yeah, think about it this way. You know, Kamala Harris attacks Trump for being a rapist, which she should do because he is a rapist. Um, Trump can then say, oh, but look at this liability with regard to Josh Shapiro. I mean, Trump would be a hypocrite and he doesn't have a leg to stand on, but he can do that. He can say, hey, why won't Josh Shapiro 
release this person from her NDA? What does he have to hide? And remember back in 2016, Trump brought out Clinton's accusers to the debate. Do we really want to set ourselves up for a situation where Trump can bring this person who's probably really pissed off at Shapiro's office? I mean, he's not directly implicated, but nonetheless, you know, the buck stops with you. This happened under your watch. And if she can't talk and Trump offers her a way to get her message out there, do you honestly want this as a liability? Again, I understand the electoral argument. He's from Pennsylvania. You need to win that state. It's a must-win state. He's very popular. But I mean, if you go with him, when you have this giant glaring issue, this could be a disastrous pick. Now, I want to read a little bit from this article here. This is from David Cleon, somebody who I really respect. He talked about how, you know, the one vice presidential pick who could ruin Democratic unity, it's Josh Shapiro. Now, we're not going to read all of this, but we'll read some of this here because I think that now if we still have a chance, maybe if she hasn't made that decision final yet, maybe any little bit of noise we can we can make will nudge her to making a less disastrous decision. This is a hopeful moment for the whole left liberal coalition, which is important, by the way, because in France, lefties and liberals came together to defeat fascists, and we need to do that. So that means we each kind of like compromise. We we give a little, we, we get a little back in return, right? Lefties, a lot of them are pledging to support Kamala Harris, so I think that she should uh, pay it forward by... Uh, giving them a VP pick who's not going to isolate them. So Shapiro also stands out among the current field of potential running mates as being egregiously bad on Palestine. It's not just that he, like many Democrats, is an outspoken supporter of Israel, though he certainly is, uh, having championed Israel's war against Hamas consistently and without any apparent concern for Palestinian civilians. Shapiro has, moreover, done far more than most Democrats to attack pro-Palestine anti-war demonstrators in ways that call into question his basic commitment to First Amendment rights. That right there is such a problem. Again, this is a vulnerability for Kamala Harris, because she needs to make sure she distances herself from Biden's position, because that originally before the debate is what tanked him. So if she goes with somebody like this, it's going to be hard to repair that bridge between lefties and Arab Americans uh, who are very disillusioned with this administration. In his previous role as Pennsylvania Attorney General, Shapiro championed the state's constitutionally dubious anti-BDS law against Ben and Jerry's after the ice cream maker refused to license its products, uh, refused to license its product, excuse me, for sale in Israeli settlements. BDS is rooted in anti-Semitism, Shapiro wrote in a statement in 2021 as he condemned a company named for its two Jewish American founders. So he called them anti-Semitic. Uh, the stated goal of this amorphous movement is the removal of Jewish citizens from the region, and I strongly oppose their efforts. Now, they were not selling in settlements. Like, this is very specific. Like, we're not talking about Ben and Jerry's in Tel Aviv. We're talking about West Bank settlements. And he called Ben and Jerry's, two CEOs of this company, both Jewish, he called them anti-Semitic for that. That is an extreme position here. As governor, Shapiro's particular animus against pro-Palestine activism has only grown more apparent and troubling. Last December, he played an active role in the GOP-orchestrated sacking of University of Pennsylvania President Liz McGill during a visit to Goldie, the popular Philadelphia restaurant co-owned by the Israeli-born celebrity chef Michael Solomonov. Shapiro condemned uh, Majil's testimony on alleged anti-Semitism on the Ivy League campus before Representative Elise Stefanik, the MAGA rights uh, grand inquisitor. That was an unacceptable statement from the president of Penn, Shapiro said, referring to McGill's unwillingness to, to accept Stefanik's slippery framing excuse me, on what constitutes anti-Semitism. Frankly, I thought her comments were absolutely shameful. It should be it should not be hard to condemn genocide. Um, Majil resigned four days after her testimony and three days after Shapiro's statement, legitimizing the GOP's wider assault on academic freedom, which would be repeated successfully against Harvard President Claudine Gay weeks later. In April, Shapiro's office baselessly claimed that a peaceful pro-Palestine encampment on the Penn campus threatened student safety. 
Quote, if the universities in accordance with their policies can't guarantee the safety and security and well-being of the students, then I think it is incumbent upon a local mayor or a local governor or local town councilor, whoever is local leadership there, to step in and enforce the law, Shapiro told Politico at the time. In May, he urged Penn to shut down the encampment completely. The University of Pennsylvania has an obligation to their safety, he said, once again alluding to non-existent threats to the physical well-being of Jewish students. It is past time time for the university to act to address this to disband the encampment and to restore order and safety on campus the university complied one day later uh, uh one day and 33 arrests later shapiro's office said penn made the right decision now he was going with this narrative that like jewish students were under threat when a lot of the students at these encampments were jewish themselves so he was participating in that smear campaign against anti-genocide protesters now, he continues, that same week, the New York Times profiled Shapiro as one to watch in his party with the headline, A Rising Democrat Leans Into the Campus Fight Over Anti-Semitism. In that piece, Shapiro made clear the low regard in which he holds pro-Palestine campus activists. If you had a group of white supremacists camped out and yelling racial slurs every day, that would be met with a different response than anti-Semites camped out yelling anti-Semitic tropes, he told the Times. This echoed a statement made in an earlier interview in which he compared campus protests to the Ku Klux Klan. You understand why this is bad? Then, in an executive order, Shapiro updated his administration's code of conduct to forbid state employees from engaging in scandalous or disgraceful behavior, a vaguely worded instruction that civil libertarians immediately interpreted as threatening pro-Palestine speech. Okay. This is a problem. Now, I think that why he's a rising star in the Democratic Party is because... Another thing that they like is that he sounds like Obama. If you listen to a speech from him, he has the Obama impression down way better than Beta O'Rourke, way, way better than uh, Pete Buttigieg. In fact, let me try to see if I could find you um, a clip. How many girls who lack access to pads and tampons at home and at school? Look, I know this is something we don't often talk about. You can like close your eyes and he sounds like Obama. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is the clip. I can't remember it. He's on the stage. He like kind of meanders over, you know, can't really walk well. And he goes over to the flag and he like hugs the flag. And I love the flag, but it's a weird thing he does. Right. But why He sounds like Obama. So like I'm already kind of just like putting aside policy. Just the Obama impression is getting under my fucking skin. Now, I want to go to this clip here because... Like a lot of lefties, Mehdi Hassan is desperately trying to make the case for Tim Waltz. I think that when it comes to a VP pick, rule number one is do no harm. Trump, he chose the worst possible pick. The worst possible pick. Kamala cannot make that same mistake because if she does, she risks further alienating lefties that she needs. Right now, she has everything going for her. And if she chooses a bad VP like Josh Shapiro and Mark Kelly, another terrible one, that momentum could be crushed, right? She doesn't want to blunt her own momentum. And by the way, Mark Kelly is horrible for a number of reasons. He was against the PRO Act, but all of a sudden flipped now that there's a little bit of opposition from labor unions to him being the, the VP. On top of that, he showed up to Netanyahu's speech and was applauding him. I think applauding a war criminal, not the best look if, again, you want to repair this bridge that's been burned between, you know, lefties and Arab Americans and Muslims who are against genocide and disillusion with the Biden administration. But let's hear the case that Mehdi Hassan makes for Tim Walsh, because I think, look, if you're if you're Kamala Harris, this is an easy decision. Tim Walsh, you pick him, liberals are going to be fine with it. Lefties will be ecstatic because this will feel like an olive branch being extended to them, which is something we rarely get. Biden kind of tried to do that with elected lefties. Um, Kamala needs to continue to try to repair this relationship between the left and the Democratic Party because it's badly damaged right now. And, you know, if you do this, you're not going to piss off liberals. But you'll make lefties happy if you pick Shapiro, you know, liberals will be happy. But lefties will be pissed off. Like the easiest way to get out of this without pissing anyone off is to pick Tim Walz, who labor unions and lefties are 
begging you to pick. Joining me now to make the case for Waltz as VP, journalist and editor in chief of Zeteo, Mehdi Hassan. He's also the author of the new column, Why Kamala Harris Should Pick Tim Waltz as Her Running Mate. To the point, Mehdi, nice to have you on. Thank you so much. I mean, you've been kind of walls pilled, as they say, like so many who are now backing the Minnesota governor for VP. Why do you think he should be the one? Laura, thanks for having me. I think it's a great question. Look, a lot of us have been walls pilled in recent days because we've been watching endless clips of this guy just on cable, on CNN, on network television, but also going back months and months to when he was signing in free school breakfasts and lunches, going on roller coasters with his daughter. The guy is super likable, super charismatic, super eloquent, knows how to take the fight to the GOP, um, and has a great record. And Laura, I think the point of a vice presidential pick for me should be twofold. Number one, Kamala Harris needs an attack dog. Someone who can take the fight to the Republican Party, to Vance, to Trump, to MAGA. And number two, someone who can mobilize the base. She's done a great job of getting enthusiasm back in the Democratic Party. You need to build on that. You don't want any kind of candidate who's going to demobilize that base. And I think Waltz wins on both counts. He's, he's great at taking on the Republicans. He's, he's America's fun uncle. He's amiable. He's snarky. He has a way with words. Tim Kaine he ain't. And I don't think the Democrats want another Tim Kaine uh, from 2016. So he's, he's great at all of that, stuff that I love. I'm a guy who loves a good debate, a good rhetorical fight. He's great at that. And his record is amazing in Minnesota. This is a guy who, with a one-seat majority in the state Senate, uh, got a child tax credit done, got education spending, health spending, infrastructure spending, ho uh, housing spending, gun control, codification of abortion rights. The list goes on and on. He did it in one legislative mm. session. So... Midwestern governor, fun guy, 24-year veteran of the Army National Guard, and he took his high school football team to its first state-winning <laughs> championship. Put him on the ticket. What are we waiting for? Man, you described Minnesota nice and now a football story. There's a slow clap coming from someone in somewhere in the world. Let me ask you, though, Mehdi, about that particular record as governor. Because as you said, attack dog is one of the criteria. You want someone who can echo the message. But he has included a number of so-called progressive initiatives. Well, progressive now, aside from his policies, which are really good and what he's been able to accomplish, he is not a lightning rod to people who care about Palestine. So he actually talked about the uncommitted movement. I, I can't remember which network he was on. It was CNN, MSNBC. But he said, listen, Biden is, has an obligation to listen to these people because their concerns are legitimate. Um, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I mean, somebody who has that attentiveness to like what what the left wants, who's sensitive to the the concerns of the left. That's a great pick that would unify the party. Again, you're not going to piss off liberals and Democratic Party loyalists by picking somebody like Tim Walz. The only potential to piss people off is lefties. So, uh, you know, as as uh, Mehdi was saying, you have so much going for you right now. Don't ruin it yes yeah, brian says he's he's uh gen z's bernie sanders yeah in a way increasing spending for welfare programs legalizing recreational marijuana implementing universal yeah. gun background checks just to name a few and you've named several of them as well you you know that harris is already being labeled this radical liberal label whether that's true to you or not that okay this is something that i think they're also considering where it's like, oh, my God, if she picks Tim Walls, then it's just going to be they're going to call them both communists. It doesn't matter. They call Joe Biden a communist. Remember back in 2020 during the Democratic Party primaries, you know, they were like, oh, you can't pick Bernie Sanders because they're going to call him a socialist and a communist or whatever. They called Joe Biden a communist. Kamala Harris is going to be called a commie. And whoever she chooses will be called a commie. She could pick Joe Manchin. They're going to call him a commie. That to me is absolutely not a persuasive argument. Do not think about what Republicans want. Think about what your base needs right now and what's going to get them fired the fuck up even more. Because if you pick Tim Walz, like, the enthusiasm is going to go through the fucking roof. I can assure you that because not only are we excited to have somebody that progressive on the ticket, but we're not dreading in four to eight years having to defeat this VP who we all don't like, who's very unpopular. He could be the next standard bearer for the party and signals that they're willing to move in a more progressive, less neoliberal direction. I mean, the writing's on the wall. It's just, it, just pick him. God damn it. Just pick Tim Walls. I, I wish that, uh, I wish that they could hear me. Like I wish Kamala's people was watching, but they're not. <laughs> and they're going to pick what they want to pick. But you know, it's just, it's, su it's such a, it makes so much sense. Does these different legislative initiatives, would that help or harm the ticket based on what he has done? 
It's a great question. Uh, Jake Tapper asked, your colleague Jake asked Tim Walsh this question earlier. He had, a great, he had a great response, which is why I'm starting to love this guy. He goes, am I a monster for wanting to give kids free breakfasts and lunches? <laughs> I just think, great, bring it on. If the Republicans want to go after his record and say, wow, he's the evil monster who gave free school lunches and meals. He's the guy who got abortion rights done. He's the guy who got gun control done. Remember, 80%, 90% of Americans, including a majority of Republicans, support background checks. It's more popular than apple pie. So go after his record. Go, good luck with that. He's a Midwestern governor. He's an army veteran. He's from a rural town. Go for it. Good luck to you. I mean, he's, he's from, he, he ticks so many boxes. And here's an important point, Laura. You know, people say, oh, progressive, progressive. The Democratic base is pretty progressive right now. One of the problems Biden has is that, had is that young people, black people, Arab Americans in Michigan, um, labor unions were not infused on multiple levels, including on Gaza. And what Walt Springs is a He's a candidacy with very little baggage compared to Josh Shapiro, Mark Kelly. Impressive things. Exactly. Key swing states, but have baggage when it comes to labor unions, when it comes to education policy in Shapiro, when it comes to Gaza, of course. When, and of course, I, thinking about that issue and the latter of him, this has been a problem in terms of the undecided vote, the uncommitted vote, for example, yeah. in places like Michigan or also in my own, actually home state of Minnesota. We think about this, but you've mentioned seeing him all over the airwaves. I mean, we've seen, frankly, multiple VP contenders who were hit in those airwaves. Here's a little bit of a sample of how Walls has been attacking Republicans and notably kicking off the, well, the weird trend. Listen. These are weird people on the other side. They want to take books away. They want to be in your exam room. Have you ever seen the guy laugh? That seems very weird to me that, a, that an adult can go through six and a half years of being in the public eye. If he has laughed, it's at someone, not with someone. How often in the world do you make that bastard wake up afterwards and know that a black woman kicked his ass and sent him on the road? That is what you oh, describe yeah. as Minnesota nice, people, in case you were wondering what that phrase really means. Uh, he did tell Anderson, by the way, that he's not calling Trump supporters weird, just Trump and Vance. I do wonder, because yes. there's been a lot of criticism about this phrase, is this the ammunition to be used as the new deplorables comment? No, not at all. And there hasn't been lots of criticism, Laura. The only people criticizing are the weirdos. Look, the reality is that the phrase works. The fact that it's bothering Vivek Ramaswamy so much and Donald Trump and J.D. Vance tells you that it's working. And look, I have waited years, Laura, for an elected national Democrat to go on TV and talk about Donald Trump in the terms we just heard from Tim Walz. That is what Kamala Harris needs on the ticket. She doesn't need a Mark Kelly who in Arizona has to say stuff like, my Republican colleagues are wonderful people, they work very hard. This is not the election. This is the election where you need a fighter, someone who can call out the MAGA weirdos and dangerous folks, the leaders on the other side. Otherwise, yeah, you will end up in a Tim Kaine situation. I would not want to see us back in a Tim Kaine situation. With the great respect to Tim Kaine, but it's not the right role. Yeah, listen, I agree wholeheartedly. A lot of liberals like to you know, point out how good Pete Buttigieg is at debunking GOP bullshit. Tim Walz is equally effective at messaging. To get somebody like that on the ticket who is likable and not somebody who comes from McKinsey, which is very important, makes him much better than uh, Pete Buttigieg, I mean, he'd be invaluable. So I have no idea who she's going to pick. We'll all find out by Tuesday. But Jesus Christ, please just make it Tim Waltz and don't let it be Josh Shapiro because I genuinely worry that if she chooses Josh Shapiro, a lot of the momentum, a lot of the lefties who are currently contemplating voting for her and not staying home or voting third party, they're going to change their, their minds. Uh, and even if they don't change their minds, if this is a gut punch to them, then that momentum is going to hurt. Like you want them to be excited. You want them to make memes and shit posts and attack Republicans for you. So don't do anything to take the wind out of their fucking sails. That's all that I'm asking. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 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 <laughs> they not like us. Tree? Tree? <laughs> you think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs>